So first of all, I wanted to thank all the co-hosts, George, uh, Zishan, and Josh. And uh, thanks everyone who came today to participate and chat about data engineering, data quality, and other topics. We are still experimenting with this new medium, but hope that you'll find this um, an exciting and uh, insightful conversation. So I'd like to start with brief introductions of uh, all the co-hosts. George, do you want to go first? My name is George. Uh, my background is in analytics and data. I've spent most of my career doing that, most recently at Lyft, uh, where I joined as the first analytics hire. Spent about five to six years building out the team and overseeing uh, some of the early business intelligence efforts, uh, but also running into a lot of data quality issues over the years. Um, and then, you know, more recently, I've been exploring a few directions uh, in, the, in the data space. I'm, you know, happy to and excited to talk about data quality issues. It's always a fun, if somewhat painful, you know, topic to, to come back to. Awesome. Thanks, George. All right, Zishan, uh, let's try do a sound check and intro with you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Oh, nice. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for having me, Gleb. Uh, I've been at Shopify for about five years now. I started out by building our uh, analytics collection platform uh, for storefront data. And over the last three years, I've been leading our team uh, that basically built our event streaming platform. Uh, schematize data collection and anything related to that. Awesome. Thanks, Dishan. And I'd also like to welcome Josh Temple from uh, So thanks for having me. I'm Josh Temple. My full-time job is at Spotify. I'm an analytics engineer there, um, working on some with ML platform type work to think about the way that we segment um, Spotify users. But over the past couple of years, I've been working on a new project uh, called Spectacles. Spectacles is a continuous integration tool for Looker. So it's a automated testing platform that started out as a uh, open source CLI and is now a hosted web app. And I'm really excited to be here talking about this topic because I feel like as a as a self-taught um, data person, I didn't realize I didn't really have the engineering kind of education to realize how important things like quality and testing were. So it's something I've been I've been really interested in. It's been a big part of my journey over the past few years. So looking forward to the conversation. Great. Thanks, everyone. So to build up on what Josh said about continuous integration, I think what I've observed uh, over the last five years, and by the way, I forgot to give uh, my intro. So my name is Gleb. I am currently CEO and co-founder of Datafold. We're building a data observability platform to help data teams monitor their data assets and infrastructure and automate certain workflows around data quality. So before that, I, I uh, led data productivity tools at Lyft, so worked together with George, and then was head of product at a company called Phantom Auto, where I built super real-time data pipelines to control uh, autonomous vehicles remotely. So. The topic of continuous integration and data quality in general has really picked up in the recent years. And I think something we've seen over the last, let's say, five years is that uh, data and analytics historically seen as a byproduct of engineering and a standalone process and something that people do to inform their decisions is now getting um, expectations almost as of uh, production systems. So there is no more um, ability to just try things and ship things without uh, providing an SLA for things like data availability, for data timeliness, and for the quality. And so I think that many data teams have been really challenged by the stakeholders and by the needs of their business because all of a sudden, they uh, had to switch their processes and tools. And so we've started seeing the um, coming of tools like continuous integrations and the processes like testing, 
uh, code reviews, code versioning into the world of data. So I know that both uh, Zishan and Josh, you've spent a lot of time thinking about continuous integration and testing of data pipelines and BI pipelines. So Zishan, I've also listened recently to your uh, performance at the Data Engineering Podcast where you shared how you've implemented reliable and also very approachable data engineering practice with GPT at Shopify. So it would be really great to hear you know, a brief version of uh, how did you manage to democratize the process of creation data pipelines with GPT, but also while making it reliable, making sure that people don't break things. Hey, Clip, yeah. Uh, like your point about the separation between engineering and data science slash data is something that really resonates with me. So like a quick history of how like we started collecting our data, like in 2015, 2016, Shopify's a data collection system was completely uh, unschematized. So you, we had a library called Trekkie where you could literally just say trekkie.track and send any data. Uh, and what we found was that there was the separation between engineering and data where the engineering team thought that uh, I am collecting this data for the data scientist. I don't really need to use it. Um, and the data scientist will tell me when things, uh, when things break or if things are useful or not. Uh, and we found that the iteration cycle and uh, the data quality cycle there was in the order of months. So we sometimes had outages where someone would discover something was lost three months out. And that like that was really not sustainable as we were growing as a company. So what we decided to push for was to push all the data contracts uh, and everything as close to the engineering team as possible to enable the engineering team to be able to work with the data directly. So effectively what we wanted to do was to make the engineering team think in terms of the data that they were collecting and not the infrastructure. So not about, you know, I need to provision some Kafka topics or I need to create some tables in Hive. Like the goal was to automate all of that. So the system we came up with in 2017 was basically a very uh, strict slash uh, uh, guideline, like everything was uh, automated in the sense that uh, we even forced you to create schema versions. We forced you to create uh, minor versions. Uh, we checked immutab immutability of your schemas. So whenever an engineer defined that they wanted to collect this new event, uh, you may call it like add to cart or something. We provisioned everything else. We published all the libraries for them. Uh, and then they could, and the biggest part was uh, adding testing helpers for them. So a lot of our work was focused on how can people, because Shopify is mainly a Rails company, how can we make the engineers collect the data and also test it uh, and break it as soon as possible? Uh, so that really helped us out. Uh, and then, so that was like the first part of our uh, data collection journey. Uh, that, uh, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, more recently, I think you've also started working. So one of the things that I think you shared in the data engineering podcast is the need to really democratize the use of data. And so one thing that you guys did is you standardized on SQL as a mainstream and default way for processing data. And then you chose GPT for as a framework for organizing those those jobs, right? And DBT already comes with uh, a really opinionated, but yet quite lightweight and elegant way to implement sort of solid, what is considered to be solid software engineering pro um, processes and patterns in the world of data analytics, right? So for example, code versioning and documentation that lives near the code and seamless continuous integration process that allows you to always sort of stage your changes and test them before you push them to production. So I'd like to just double click on that and um, see in a, such a huge organization such as Shopify, and uh, I imagine your data team is also quite large. How did you see adopting such a one, you know, on the one hand simplistic, but on the other hand, quite a pinnated framework for data reliability? Yeah. Uh opinionated slash restricted 
which uh, we've come to realize is actually good. So in the early days, we kind of let data scientists decide how they wanted to do their modeling, whether it be notebooks or PySpark. And we found that people really wanted guide rails, like just give me the set of instructions to follow and I'll do it. Um, so with DBT, what we noticed was that uh, a lot of people, like the workflow was all of our data lived in Presto. So people would create a bunch of scratch tables or model their things in SQL uh, and then have, you know, like a prototype table uh, that would they would want to work with. And then they wanted to productionize it. And then their biggest hurdle was that, hey, now I have to go convert this whole thing into Spark. So our focus was that if we can just go where the user is, and basically that's where DBT is, um, we effectively like take away the second part of their process, which is the conversion process. So they can iterate in their uh, iteration cycle uh, and then just effectively uh, productionize whatever they had come up with. Uh, that being said, I mean, not like we don't necessarily want them to take like their prototype tables and convert it into a production model without following any rules. So that's where I think DBT's like, you know, Git based operations uh, and like the review cycle comes in super helpful. Uh, but uh, yeah, like testing was something we found that still needs a lot of work. So we've like, as we discussed in the podcast, we've come up with a Python based mock testing framework. We're still not like it is, it's gotten good adoption. We initially tested out like CSV based data testing. Uh, and that wasn't like some people really liked that. But what we found was that people were testing full suites together and not like unit test. So our focus right now is to enable people to test uh, single features with the Python based framework. Uh, it's still a bit early to say how the adoption will be. So far, it's pretty good. Uh, a lot of people are coming to DBT because they see that the iteration cycle is really fast. Um, but if they really need a lot of power, then they have to drop back down to Spark. Interesting. And uh, Zishan, when you mentioned the unit testing, I imagine this is not uh, something which is familiar to the most listeners here where you basically run some sort of assertion on your data like is this column unique i imagine this is something like uh, you have a part of a sql query that you run on some synthetic data and you're checking whether that uh basically true unit test is actually uh passing or not right so it's not actually running profiling or assertions on the production data it's just testing the code itself correct Yes, yes. So it's mostly testing things like if you're doing some sort of uh, segmentation by device type and you're like, you know, all my Safari user agents are categorized as iPhone types and not anything else. Very cool. Any plans to open source your unit testing framework? I think we'd really like to upstream. Like one thing we've realized is staying as close to the upstream branch is the best. Uh, and we want, we've been working with Drew from DBT a lot, uh, and hopefully like after our learning experience, we are able to open source this as a complementary package to DBT. Great. So I'd like to shift the gears a little bit here. And, uh, so we've talked about the reliability and CI and data pipelines and how DBT, DBT can enable that. But one thing that I think is also becomes apparent is that data pipeline is not just about the tables that you create in your warehouse. A lot of business logic, a lot of um, information is embedded in the BI tools that are actually reading that information. So tools like, you know, Periscope, Mode, Lookers, uh, and open source layers like Redash and Metabase, they also contain a lot of business logic that ultimately dictates what our users are seeing on the dashboards. And so, I know that Josh, you've uh, done a lot of work into making sure that the BI dashboards also have the same treatment of production data pipelines with Spectacle. So could you do a, a brief overview why continuous integration and testing in BI is important and what are the problems that you're seeing that needs to be addressed currently with the BI market? Yeah, definitely. I think one thing that, that Zifan said that I really, that resonated with me is 
thinking about continuous integration, not just from software best practice kind of standpoint, but it's actually a step of, of data governance. And I think governance gets harder the farther away you get from um, the more technical folks on the team or like away from the warehouse itself. And so when you think about a BI tool, uh, it's much closer to uh, the end user who's using that information to drive a business decision. And therefore it's, it's harder to govern because it's not as like tightly controlled by the processes that might govern things like, um, you know, your, your company's website or your data engineering pipelines. And so what we're trying to do with spectacles is to make the, um, the benefits of continuous integration in the sense that you can catch mistakes, you can, um, apply standards to the development that your analytics team is doing. Uh, you can monitor for unexpected events, all of those great benefits of continuous integration. We're trying to make that just as easy in the BI layer. And we have the advantage with Looker and that like Looker was always designed to be something that embraced software engineering principles. So, you know, it already has versioning baked in. It already has, um, a, basically a unit testing feature baked in. And so we're, we're just providing the, the scaffolding around that to, um, allow teams who may be made up of analysts without a lot of experience with something like CI to quickly get started and, and start reaping the benefits. And, um, We've already seen that with some of our like earlier customers. We had um, one of our early users come to us and say, "Hey, I just joined the team, and he was working on a um, a central BI team, kind of like a hub and spoke model. And that central BI team reviewed all of the pull requests um, of the embedded like Looker analysts throughout the organization, and so he was." able to get ramped up much more quickly with spectacles because he didn't have to feel like he needed to be an expert on the company's looker instance right off the bat. He was, he was confident that spectacles via CI was catching the kind of like basic mistakes, typos in SQL, you know, violating the um, metrics guardrails that the company had set up, things like that. And he could focus on, okay, well, is this the right business logic? Is this good design? Are we surfacing this information in the user friendly way? And so I think, I mean, in the spirit of like automating the boring stuff, um, spectacles and, and CI more generally is really great for that kind of thing, like allowing humans to focus on what humans do best and not worrying about um, things that a computer can catch for you. What are they, what are some types of checks that a person would have to do? Let's say a BI developer who tries to build a new exploration in Looker or a dashboard that's your that they can automate with spectacles. Yeah. So the main one, and, and this is a little bit unique to Looker is that Looker, uh, validates the way that you have written LookML in the sense that like a compiler would validate something like it checks the syntax. Did you, you know, leave off a curly brace here, et cetera. What it doesn't check is the interaction between Looker and the data warehouse. So you write SQL snippets in your LookML that define how Looker will go and query the database when a user goes to build a report or run a dashboard or something like that. And that's never validated. Um, so it's very easy for someone in Looker to push out a new explorer or a new dashboard and not realize that you know, one of the dimensions is fundamentally broken and won't run against the warehouse. And if you think about, um, I, like Gleb, you were alluding to at the beginning of the conversation where it's, it's now we're starting to like productize and, and productionize data. If you imagine people who have Looker actually embedded in their company's products, that's a non-starter. You can't, you know, you can't push out something with a, a broken dimension in it that's going to display this angry red SQL error to your, you know, your company's customers. That's just not an option. Um, so that's, that's a great one. Uh, you can also check for the, the consistency uh, between the content that you have and what's defined in LookML. So if you accidentally remove something that is a dependency of one of your key dashboards, that will be caught. And then lastly, we'll run Looker's, uh, what are called data tests. They're kind of like unit tests where you can define assertions in a Looker friendly way and, and we'll run those. So you could run them on a schedule and make sure like, for instance, your conversion rate is not a negative number. Um, and then I think the last thing that I would call out that we're really excited about is we're working on a DBT integration as well. So what we imagine a future state could be is um, your data engineers who are changing or your analytics engineers who are changing the warehouse schema 
in making changes to the models in DVT, um, they should also know if the changes they're making have downstream implications on Looker. So actually being able to test that, yeah, if I make this change to these tables in the warehouse, I'm not fundamentally breaking anything about Looker for my data scientists or analysts. I think that'll be basically closing the loop. Got it. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned the integration with DBT because it seems like they've really spearheaded the sort of new generation analytical workflow. And so they become almost like a central hub for uh, also managing the quality, be that in the warehouse or in the BI tool. So one thing that we've observed also with, uh, with our customers using DBT is that the workflow of changing the DBT models where you introduce the change to the SQL logic that basically materializes tables in your warehouse is something that is really hard to test oftentimes. And so we've today already covered things like assertions that are coming out of the box with DBT framework and then Zishan also mentioned the unit testing frameworks that actually tests the code um, itself against some synthetic data. And then basically with spectacles, you can get the um, checks of downstream BI dependencies with Looker in particular. And something we've also uh, built at Datafold is a tool called DataDiff, which is essentially a Git diff for data. It shows you how a change in the source code affects the data produced by your ETL code. And so you can easily see, for example, if I'm changing a column in a given DPT model, what's going to happen to that column, what's going to happen to all the downstream use cases, be that uh, BI or uh, other tables drawing from it. And one thing that I also keen to explore is any kind of process and tooling that we're talking about here is really cannot exist without being embedded into a process and into workflows of people. So let's say with all these tools, to what extent um, you think that it should be up to the developer to use those tools, to what extent it should be enforced? Um, and basically, do you actually see the pull requests being reviewed as a must or do you do you have a way to block that code from entering the production or is it everything at the discretion of the developer so really curious to hear how it works at shopify and spotify given the sizes of your organizations and the need to move both fast while not breaking things in production uh yeah so i think like in terms of data quality, uh, we see data, like there's multiple phases of data quality checks, right? Like one of the phases could be like right after the data is collected, but before it is modeled. And I see that uh, almost similar to like operational checks. So like checks that you would have in Datadog on your production systems. Uh, and that is something that we have systems for to monitor uh, deviations uh, in you know, like if someone's like really hammering us uh, from a certain uh, IP range, uh, we don't really want that to skew our data. Uh, then once the data is in the warehouse, uh, we have this notion of correctness, which uh, Gleb, you were saying is like unit testing, right? Like, so any model that is introduced, uh, our system will not let you make a breaking change uh, in a fashion that breaks uh, downstream models or will not let you make a breaking change that breaks any of the tests. Uh, but like the thing that is more nuanced uh, for me is like, you might have something that is, you know, like programmatically correct, uh, but it could based on like, you know, unforeseen data, it could result in wrong numbers. And that's something, you know, as your data sets get larger and larger, uh, or if you're doing like any sort of incremental processing, that's something we're trying to explore. How can we make those out of bound, out of band checks uh, much more reactive to the user? Uh, and like, I'm almost imagining that, you know, as soon as you check in something uh, into the data warehouse, uh, you get pinged uh, or you get emailed on Slack once some of those, you know, uh, async tests have run uh, and then can send you a sample of the data. Cool. So how do you go about enforcing data quality checks at Spotify, Josh? Uh, 
Yeah, so Spotify is a little interesting in this case because it's a pretty decentralized organization and we follow the philosophy of, you know, you build it, you maintain it, and you're responsible for it. So um, I think Spotify is much more, like our, our platform teams that are centralized are much more interested in making the tooling required to put tests in place and to monitor data metrics and things like that. They're, they're much more interested in making that very easy for people to adopt, but not necessarily like centralizing and and like mandating that you can't make this change or that change um, with regards to data quality. So uh, I, I would just say that the way that it works at Spotify is when you create new data pipelines, um, generally you're working off of like a template, a templated project. And, you know, those projects have kind of best practices based into them, like certain amount of test coverage is required. And um, the understanding is that, you know, you'll, you'll use those best practices to build a system that's maintainable over time. Got it. It's very interesting to see how companies always uh, basically find it challenging and uh, try to be very nuanced around introducing those sort of guidelines and tooling and also, you know, trying to balance the ability for the team to move really fast and create things and at the same time not breaking things uh, that can hurt the business which also leads me to another topic that i'd like to discuss today so with things like unit tests and ci uh, and breaking changes so these are almost like black and white right so we know when things are wrong and when they are right and this is something which we can codify in things like you know unit tests and assertions but one of the big challenges that I've observed at Lyft and also heard from other big companies is the problem of multiple sources of truth. So essentially, the more democratized your data is and the more uh, people are enabled, the more people you enable to create data sets outside of your central data engineering team, the more you'll see patterns where different teams would compute the same metrics, you know, be that retention or the cost of user acquisition in different ways and so ultimately you end up with having multiple sources of truth that needs to be reconciled at the decision maker level because otherwise you can't really run business and that is a hard problem for data teams to manage uh, technically but also in terms of the organizational structure and politically because at some at some point that can become a really big challenge if you have different data points that are telling your business to move deep in in different directions. So I know that George, uh, you've run analytics at Lyft and you've uh, heard about and experienced this problem firsthand. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and how do you see that problem being solved with either processes or tools today? Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, yeah, there's this fundamental tension between data democratization and data governance, which I think you know, Josh spoke to as well, where as a company grows, the natural job of the data team is to provide more and more people within the organization with access to data and tools for decision making. But the challenge is how do you make sure all those people are using data in the same way? And at Lyft and many other companies that we've spoken to, you typically start out with a single BI tool uh, like a looker or a tableau and everybody's looking at some set of dashboards and everything's pretty manageable then what ends up happening is as the company grows you have more and more functional teams uh, the product team the sales team the marketing team the operations team and all of them have different tools that they prefer to consume data look at data visualize data and so you know at lyft the way this played out was we brought on Mode, which is a SQL editor, then we brought on Looker, then we brought on Tableau. We started incubating Superset, which is an open source business intelligence platform internally. Um, and then there were a handful of internal applications that were being built, all kind of looking at different views of the same data. Um, but the challenge was we started realizing that all these teams were looking at the same metrics in different ways. So for example, 
we did, we never really got to a, a single source of truth on revenue uh, or basic metrics like conversion because at any given time there were different versions of that floating around and you know at the end of the day the way this plays out is you're in a meeting with the CFO or some senior person they're looking at two different numbers and there's a room full of people decision makers who don't know what to trust um, and so that's the story that plays out um, you know at, at many companies and the question is how do you reconcile all these different disparate definitions that might, might lie across all these different tools or all these different teams? Um, and the answer isn't to have everybody use one tool. You can't just have the answer, um, you know, in my opinion, isn't to have everyone look at Looker uh, because as great of a tool as Looker is, um, what I found is you know, the data science teams are all, always going to be comfortable in their Jupyter notebooks. Um, you know, the sales team is always going to be, you know, working in Salesforce and, you know, good luck trying to get a finance person to use anything other than a spreadsheet. Right. And, and so, you know, what, what I think the right solution is, and I don't think this is a complete solution, but I think the direction that we need to start heading is to move more of the business logic, um, down the stack. So today, a lot of the business logic the final aggregation logic of how you actually compute metrics is left to the BI tools. I think you need to start pushing that down into a layer that is much more coupled with say the data warehouse or data modeling tools like GPT and, and less uh, with the visual the visualization layer. So, um, and then that layer can be a single source of truth that can be interoperable with all the different surfaces and tools uh, and interfaces that people already use. Um, so, so let me let me stop there for a sec. George, if I could ask a quick follow up question, I, I love what you're saying there. Another thing that I think I've noticed with with multiple sources of truth is not necessarily um, proliferation of tools, but proliferation of analyses for the same thing within the same tool. And so, I guess I'm curious to know, like, to what extent do you think data discoverability is also a component here of letting people find the right answer that was calculated the first time rather than 10 teams doing it themselves in their own way. Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, I think at Lyft, we, we certainly had this problem. We actually built a, um, an internal data discovery tool that's open source called the Munson. Um, you know, you guys might've heard of it and, and it was to solve exactly this problem. It was, you know, you know, helping people find the assets. And in, in, in our case, it was, we were big users of mode analytics and there were just so many different mode reports and dashboards floating around and nobody had any idea um, what to trust, what was still being used, what was deprecated, et cetera. Um, but I think discoverability is only part of the solution. I, I think, you know, even what, <clears throat> excuse me, even after we stood up months and we still had the challenge of, okay, We've now been able to find the data and we know what people are using, but what does it really mean? And, and is it right? Um, we can find specific tables, but how do you actually write a query that gets me the right calculation and the right number that I can take to a decision maker? And I think um, there was still a gap there. Uh, and I think the solution is probably cover, you know, coupling something like a discoverability tool, but with, um, stricter ownership of the metadata around definitions themselves, uh, which is something I think that um, doesn't really exist today. This is very interesting. And I'm wondering, so we have this big, uh, you know, SQL world with, you know, led by DBT and some other vendors in the space like Dataform, Dexter, um, Prefect, they're trying to make it really easy to create transformations in the warehouse. And then we have some BI players like Looker and Tableau and others that are essentially almost creating their own domain specific languages for defining metrics, defining uh, the ways that people interact with data. So, how would that? way of defining and centralizing metrics being different from, let's say, just making another table in DBT, right, and writing SQL for it? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, it, it's great that you kind of brought up Looker and the domain specific language that it that it has, um, because I think that Looker is actually come the closest to providing the right type of interface for end consumers um, and and threading this needle between data governance and uh, enabling decision makers and people to query the data in a self-serve but but source of truth way um, and the challenge I think with with uh, looker though is that not everyone's going to use looker so you know if there was a domain specific language like, Look ML, but that was interoperable with all different types of applications that companies use. I think that could be very powerful. Um, with respect to DBT, you know, DBT has done a lot of the legwork, um, but they're you know very focused on producing data sets and, and batch modeling as the final output. And I think if you were to couple that with something that you know, is a domain specific language that can go the extra mile um, or the last mile for metrics, so to speak, and take that to BI tools and decision makers, then I think you would complete uh, complete the loop and that could be very powerful. Why a domain specific language though? So I know, for example, that Zishan is a big fan of SQL to make people happy. And I know Spotify is quite big on, you know, Spark and sort of have a, uh, well, powerful interfaces to processing data. So wouldn't be a domain specific language, just another complexity layer here, or would it allow us to, let's say, simplify certain expressions? Yeah, I, I think the, the reality is that different users and different tools will want to have flexibility to cut data in different ways and and so you want the flexibility and expressiveness of sql but you you don't want to have the same query with different filters many many you know multiplied many different times uh, which would lead to kind of inconsistency and so if you're able to find a way to essentially templatize the correct parts of sql um, and to make it reusable um, and 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 adhere to principles of try, then I think um, th that would be one of the things that you would be trying to solve for. Interesting. So it's also worth worth mentioning that all of my three guests today are representing or have experience with marketplace companies. So Shopify, Spotify, and Lyft are all marketplaces and. Um, or enabling marketplaces, and this basically creates a very interesting and challenging challenges for data and, lo and lots of lots of metrics that are describing how those markets are balanced. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, Zishan and Josh, how have you come across the problem of multiple sources of truth? Is it something that you actually um, take on as data leaders to solve or is it something that you try to um, you know put the responsibility on on the users to actually figure out how to define metrics and how to reconcile them between themselves uh, so going back to uh, George's point I think as we democratize data more there is certainly going to be a lot more churn uh, in the, you know data quality and the metrics, um, the pendulum at Shopify has kind of swung multiple directions. Uh, initially, we were very much of the opinion that uh, you know every data point that a certain decision maker will use needs to go through a data scientist uh, and needs to be vetted before it's used uh, to make. A final product decision uh, but now as we're scaling a lot more uh, we're realizing that uh, for certain decisions that might not be of the highest uh, risk uh, it is certainly okay for um, someone to use the data directly and it is okay to make some mistakes as long as you can learn from that right like so it, like bottlenecking uh, an engineer 
uh, because they they want to measure their product performance uh, and their team hasn't been able to get their data scientists to wet their numbers uh, is really starting to become a problem. Uh, so I think one of the examples that I can share is like initially we uh, launched Amplitude uh, as our um, funnel slash, you know, like lightweight charting, like we were big mode users, but we also launched Amplitude as like a way for product managers and engineers to use the data uh, easily. Uh, and initially we stuck with the idea that, you know, an engineer should still kind of work with the data scientists to help them review what they were uh, working with. But now we're starting to go with the uh, notion that, you know, engineers can do whatever they want in Amplitude uh, as long as they check in with the data scientists when they're making uh, a more complex decision. So I think really it it'll, it really depends on like what the what the importance of the decision to be made is. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I think we also, I mean, Spotify has the advantage of uh, it's really hard to say Spotify and Shopify multiple times and not mix them up. I, really struggle with this <laughs> but, um with, so with spotify we have the advantage of just basically being able to hire tons and tons of data scientists um in fact we pretty much have data scientists integrated into almost every product team at spotify and so you already kind of have the advantage there of people who are like data literate and are able to query data and extract some level of insights and present those to the product manager the you know, product engineers. Um, and I think that helps a lot. Another thing that we're doing from more of like an overall org standpoint is I think there's becoming a larger focus on like certifying data sets. So we have this idea of what we call a golden data set, which is a data set that's been um, vetted by a central team to say that, yeah, this is the right place to go and look for, you know, um, our, our content streams or our user information. And uh, those are a great like one-stop shop when you're just trying to do a quick query, you know, okay, this is the right, this is the source of truth that has been designated. Um, the other part of that is we have this whole series of what we call test certified for X. And so it's test certified for data, test certified for backend. Basically in all of our systems, uh, there is a three level certification that you, that your system can acquire. The first level is applied on a purely automated basis. So if I create a data pipeline, that data pipeline has unit tests, it has a documentation page, it, you know, like things that are very easy to be verified in, on an automated basis, then I automatically get this little stamp in our kind of metadata platform that says, yes, Josh is, you know, who who is listening to reply all data set is test certified for data level one. And then if I, if this is an especially critical data set and I want to go up to level two or level three, then that introduces a human into the process and they have to kind of audit some things and review some things. But that's also another really helpful way for me as a data consumer, just go and browse through things and get a sense of how experimental is this, which like Sichon was alluding to gives this kind of like risk mediated way of understanding data. Like it's very easy for people to produce data. Um, but I may be much more cautious about consuming that data if it's marked as experimental and doesn't have the appropriate certifications. Josh, uh, I had a question around that because that sounds really interesting. But how do you how do you guys handle the situation where a data site might have been approved, but then the business has changed, so the definition might not be correct six months later? Is there any sort of like certification, like almost renewal or update? that needs to happen? That's a great question. And I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, I know with the golden data sets, it's a pretty rigorous process to get something marked as a golden data set. And, and there are probably less than 10 data sets at Spotify that have that designation. So I would guess there's like a kind of repeated audit there. The like test certified component is more around the process that you're using to create the data rather than the data itself. So you could have data that's like test certified, but if you wrote the test wrong and the data is incorrect, then you know, that that's still going to be an issue, but that part can kind of remain as long as your processes are, are up to date and you're, you know, you're migrating your dependencies and things like that. Hey Josh, I had a question on that too. For the people who are able to see the golden data sets, 
um, do they have to be SQL literate in order for them to query those data sets or are there interfaces for them to where they can query those inter uh, those data sets in a more drag and drop type of um, type of interface? Yeah, they pretty much have to be SQL literate because it's um, you know it's part of our our like data discovery platform where that's it's marked and that platform is linked directly to BigQuery. So again, I think this is where like Spotify has a little bit of an advantage in the sense that there are enough data scientists throughout the company that like there's always kind of one of stones throw away that you could ask to pull data if you were not um, able to write SQL yourself. Uh, but yeah, it, it kind of stops at that at the warehouse. It's not really extended beyond that as far as I know. Yeah, what what Zishan, um, you just mentioned about the story of the, the product or the business moving ahead of the certification process for data sets, uh, certainly something that happened to us at Lyft as well, where the business was just moving so quickly, features were being developed, built, logged, that you know we would run into situations where we, we similarly had a tiered system of, of tables. I, I think we that was managed centrally. Um, and and then you would have feature teams or product teams say, no, 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 um, we actually launched this two, three weeks ago. So actually that table is no longer trustworthy. We just haven't had the time to go through the process of updating that data set with the central team because we just had to move so quickly. Um, and of course this happened across the company. And maybe this just speaks to the tension of the business needing to move really quickly the gatekeepers uh, being understaffed and and how that actually works out in practice is that you still don't really have great trust um, unless you have massively staffed the central team. Um, and and, and it, again, there comes to this tension of democratization and governance. Yeah, that, that's good to hear, George. Uh, so this is this is something that we've kind of been playing around with a bit, and I wanted to hear people's opinions around like how if if we were to look at data sets instead of as like static assets, uh, consider them as you know like versioned APIs which have a six month life cycle. Like, does that put too much onus on the data set maintainers uh, to continually? update the API uh, every six months, or is that something that seems feasible? Well, that's a very interesting way to think about it, Zishan. So basically, your your data sets become products, and then you're basically almost like subscribing to maintaining the API, not breaking it, and then have all sorts of associated expectations and SLA around them. And so I think the, the common theme that I, I'm hearing here is that data democratization, you know, as buzzwordy as it is, is extremely important. And, you know, in real terms, that means give as many people as needed access to consume and very importantly, create data. Um, and it's very important to also give people access, not just to BI tools, but if they, for example, need to materialize their tables in tools like DPT or other ETL frameworks, they also have to do so very freely. But then there is all sorts of processes that exist in data driven and in companies advanced with advanced analytics that essentially say, if you actually want us to trust this data for, let's say an executive dashboard or for an experiment or for any kind of other need like pulling it into the backend service, then it needs to go up, it needs to undergo a very strict process and have tests and then different levels of certification. Yeah, I kind of think about like the parallel with open source software where um, if I want to use a library for something, I'm checking it out on GitHub, but does it have a lot of stars? Is this something I've heard other people talk about? So you need some way of surfacing um, the popularity of something. And, and I mean, I think about the number of times where I've just sort of used something from the open source community without ever looking at the source code, just because I know other people are using it and people who know the code base better than I am are keeping an eye on what's happening. That's obviously not a perfect solution. We have issues with like security vulnerabilities and open source software and things like that. But I think it works pretty well in a democratized concept context where if you give people information about what the go-tos are, they're probably going to use those things because they care about the consequences of the work that they're doing. 
Cool. I'm wondering if anyone from our audience is excited to share any of their experiences. I think we have about five minutes left. So if you have anything to comment on what being said or anything resonates, please uh, let me know. There's a, I think there's a button here to raise a hand and uh, I'll give you a mic. And then in the meantime, I just wanted to ask our co-hosts today, what are the, what is one technology or trend happening in, in the data world right now that you are really excited about? Uh, for me, uh, something that I've been getting into over the last year is a lot of the focus on uh, streaming and more real-time data serving platforms. Uh, so like I've been really diving into Druid and Pino uh, and ClickHouse uh, over the last year. Uh, and like as a superset has matured, I think it really presents uh, a very like, you know, um, step level change for a data scientist to be able to explore the data and not have to wait on the order of minutes uh, to get an idea of what's what they're working with. That's interesting. I'm wondering though, what are some use cases for real time analytics that would actually warrant the need for people to look at data? Because ultimately, you know, I've always come at this with a philosophy that whatever data you're looking at has, has to enable certain decision. So if we're talking about, you know, data that comes within minutes, what kind of decisions, uh, well, what, what are some examples of decisions that humans can make, let's say, looking at the dashboard? So actually, when I said real time, I should have clarified, I wasn't necessarily saying real time in terms of like latency, but I was more saying real time in terms of interactiveness. Uh, and I think like, you know, if you're looking at a lot of your uh, let's say like large storefront data, like being able to splice, slice and dice by certain dimensions very fast, like less than 10 seconds or so, uh, really helps you explore the data a lot faster. Like the result doesn't have to be 100% accurate, but if it's like, you know, directionally correct, then it gives you an idea of, hey, I need to go into the SQL warehouse and dig into the data more. Uh, but just like, just exploring things, uh, like before, uh, we were using a lot of these uh, roll-up systems, uh, like trying to experiment with a larger table that had like on the order of like a couple of billion rows a day uh, was really hard. So, yeah, I can show what I'm excited about. Uh, so I've been exploring graphs as a structure for storing and processing data uh, for a while now. And I think that the graph technology was on one hand overhyped uh, over the last few years and uh, overpromise in terms of what it can deliver. But there are a few domains and few applications that actually also related to analytics where representing data is a graph and then analyzing it uh, with you know graph first algorithms and systems can actually be very effective. So fraud detection, for example, is one use case where you're dealing with highly connected data and when you can represent all the connections, you actually can extract features for fraud detection very easily. Um, I know that data catalog solutions like Amundsen also use Neo4j, for example, as they store for uh, their backend. We're also using graph database for uh, representing all the metrics that we collect about the customer's data because ultimately graph is so powerful because it can represent arbitrarily complex domains without the need to cram it into a relational model. It can be, you know, very quickly turn extremely complex. And I've also seen graph applications being applied to domains like data integration. For example, if you are dealing with data coming from multiple sources, and uh, for example, everything that you may know in the user coming from ad networks and attribution systems and other partners, that data can be very sparse and you can deal with, you know, potentially hundreds of attributes related to a particular user. And so sometimes representing that as a graph can be really effective because you don't have to, again, plan a uh, very rigid schema like with relational databases. But I think that technology is still very early on and we'll, we'll have to see tools uh, to come up that will actually make it easily consumable and pluggable into the modern data stack. That is super cool. Um, 
something uh, on a similar vein there on on kind of how do you look at data in a different way. I'm really interested in a trend that I'm seeing towards thinking about data quality less from a rules based standpoint and like was this assertion that valid or not valid and more from a statistical modeling standpoint. Um, and no offense to you, Lyft guys, but Uber had a really cool uh, post about this last year where they were basically taking all of the um, dimensions in a data set and they were applying PCA, principal component analysis, to basically compress that information. And then they were looking at those principal components and how they varied over the time series duration, the existence of that data set. And they were flagging um, anomalies in the principal component. So basically, when does this data set deviate from what it normally would be? And they were treating that as this sort of leading indicator of a data quality problem. And they were applying it at scale so that you could see how the anomalies were affecting their their entire, um, all the data that they had and, and on a data set by data set basis. Um, also, just to like plug the tool that Gleb is building, uh, you know, you can look at the difference on a column by column basis from a statistical standpoint. You can understand like is the mean changing in a statistically significant way. So kind of this like, idea of like a more unstructured approach to data quality, where it's not it's not me defining a rule and me having to think of every single test that I need to write, as useful as that is, but um, applying you know some some stats in a way that flags these issues to us in a in advance in a smarter way. I think. It's going to be a really, really useful way, especially for larger organizations with tons and tons of data to get at some of these data quality problems. Yeah, that makes so much sense, Josh. I've also read this article and it's very inspiring. Indeed, the biggest problem in, in anomaly detection and applied to data quality in particular is that because companies have thousands of data sets and you know, 50 columns on average in each, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of columns that we can potentially track and find anomalies in. And so the biggest problem is how do we know what is important to track and what is an, what is a big enough deviation to be surfaced. And then among all the anomalies that we can find in a given day, given that data is always changing, what are the things that data team should actually take action on? And there are probably like three to five things daily max that you know a team can look into let alone address at an organization given how much is going on and so definitely you know applying statistics like pca um, and column level lineage which allows to essentially see the downstream and upstream dependencies in your warehouse and consecutively understand what is the impact and potential source of a problem is something that um, i think Data quality as a domain uh, in general, but also our product is uh, moving towards. Any other thoughts on the inspiring things happening in data domain? Cool. So I think we're just uh, at an hour. So I'd like to, again, thank everyone who came today to listen to our not so structured, but hopefully um, interesting and somewhat insightful conversation about data tools. Thank you so much, Sishan, George, and uh, Josh for your time today and for sharing your experiences, learnings, and passions in data. Uh, we are definitely going to host more of these conversations. And also I'd like to, um, use this opportunity to tell everyone about our upcoming data quality meetup. So it's uh, going to be not only audio, but also video this time. It's going to happen on uh, March 11th at 9 a.m. Pacific time. We'll have lightning talks about uh, interesting tools, trends, processes around data quality and engineering, and then uh, a final discussion. So please stay tuned and thanks again for coming. Thanks a lot, Gleb. This was this was awesome. Super interesting conversation. Thanks, Gleb.